before I was before I was a month or two old, my father had announced to the world that um, that I would either be a doctor and go to Cambridge or a philosopher and go to Harvard. Um, so apparently, my father knew something that I that I didn't. I only discovered this uh, later on, looking through press cuttings. I I didn't I don't remember this from my childhood. And it, as it happens, I did study medicine at Cambridge and I did teach philosophy at Harvard. So sort of interesting. I mean. I don't remember the first time I realized that I was really interested in philosophy. I think two things happened. One is I happened to go to a school where there were other people of my age, 15, 16, 17, who, who got interested in it and they were, they were interesting and smart people and I hung out with them and we, we read philosophy together, uh, partly influenced by a couple of teachers, one, one a chaplain and the other an atheist. <laughs> It's hard to believe this, especially if you've read Language, Truth and Logic, but I found a book called Language, Truth and Logic in the book room at our school, the place where you could buy books. And, um, and I found it extremely exciting. Um, and this was a sort of positivist manifesto. I'm not any kind of positivist, really, but it was... But the idea that you could think rigorously about these important questions and that you could sort of break, break through the, the, the sort of encrusted... Um, assumptions of your society or, or of societies in general and, and sort of see through to, to a clearer vision of what the world was really like and what was really important and so on. That struck me, I think, as very exciting. And I was going through a religious crisis at the time. I was, I was an evangelical 15, 16 year old and I was, uh, in, I suppose I was in the process of losing my faith, though I wouldn't have known that at the time. Um, but I was very interested in, in sort of theological questions. And again, the kind of rigor with which philosophical argument could address these questions, which were addressed, I thought, less um, interestingly, perhaps, by in the sort of Sunday school or a religious setting. Um, I think that was part of what excited me. I have to say that um, while that's what sort of brought me to the subject, uh, I don't find myself terribly interested now in, in those questions. In the United States, where the vast majority of people claim some sort of uh, religious belief, um, haven't thought much about what that means. Uh, I mean, they haven't thought about what it means, not in terms of what they should do, but in terms of how they should think. <laughs> and in particular, uh, people are very vague, I think, uh, about what they mean when they say that they think there's a God. And one of the things that I found helpful in philosophy as a 16, 16 17 year old was attempts by philosophers to say, most of whom were quite devout and religious, but, but they were nevertheless people who wanted to be more sort of rigorous about what that meant than most people. I'm using this word rigor and I, I don't, um, I mean, I, you know, Aristotle said you should adopt the level of precision that's appropriate to the subject, so, and he was right. Basically, philosophical research is done by reading and writing and talking to people. Uh, and I would say that, you know, the, what philosophers try to do is to get clear as we can about the conceptual issues that surround some of the more important questions that human beings have to deal with, like um, if is there a God and what, what is uh, he or she like? Um, what's, how should one come to make moral judgments? Uh, what is it for, for judgment to be true? But also, um, what, is a, what does it mean to say that there are quarks? I mean, you know, science generates new questions all the time. What's a species? The, the, these questions have uh, theoretical, is, there are theoretical issues in physics and biology, but they're also raise philosophical questions which philosophers can contribute to helping to understand. So there's a vast range of things you might be spending your time on and I think the distinctive contribution of philosophers is to try and be uh, more careful about the conceptual end of these questions than most other people have to be. It's not that other people should be doing what we do. We should be doing what we do. They should be getting on with what they do as well. Uh, but it's useful in, to the civilization, to the culture, to have people around who do what we do um, I, I like to tell students that, um, you know, um, in, in a lot of life, uh, if you want to figure out what to do, you can make a sort of three-step argument. 
uh, that three-step argument for a philosopher is going to be broken down into 30 steps. We're going to look between the first and the second step, we're going to find 10, 10 stages, uh, and we're going to argue that um, it makes a difference how you understand each, each term, or it can make a difference how you understand each term. And th this is why I think uh, philosophers, since Socrates, uh, who, who, was, who was mocked for this uh, by Aristophanes, uh, the, the comic uh, uh, playwright, um, have been regarded as sort of, you know, logic choppers and, uh, and kind of fussy word mongers. Um, and you can do that, and you can get kind of a fetish about making distinctions which have no point, and I'm not interested in that. Most uh, great scientists, when they say things about the philosophy of science, about how one discovers scientific truth, about how one justifies scientific claims, about what distinguishes science from non-science and nonsense. Um, but most, but what most scientists say about that is, uh, I think, uh, uh, not terribly uh, interesting. It's not philosophically rewarding a lot of it. Uh, you don't have to have a good theoretical account of the nature of your activity in order to pursue that activity at the highest level. And that applies just as much to physics as it does to ice skating. Um, great ice skaters aren't people who have a great theory of ice skating. And great physicists aren't, I think, people who have a great theory of physics. They're people who are good at fi figuring physical things out, doing the, doing the experiments or doing the theory, the mathematical theory that's required. But they don't necessarily have a better grip than other people on, on uh, what it is about what they're doing that's distinctively successful. Just as um, one, can be, one can have very good vision but not know that it's photons of light banging onto your retina that's giving you the messages. Uh, so you can be very good at figuring out scientific things and not very good at uh, understanding how the science works. So, um, uh, so I don't think that the task of philosophy of science, say, is to provide scientists with a theoretical account of what they're doing that's going to make what they're doing better. Um, they're doing fine by themselves, if that's the question, and we, we don't, they don't need our help in that. But Science is a source of thoughts, beliefs, propositions, which the rest of us, whether we're scientists or not, have to figure out how to fit into our world. And that's, I think, a place at which philosophy can be useful. I think philosophy belongs in the humanities because I think the humanities are about, um, they're about transmitting what's valuable in our civilization for everybody. Um, if all the physicist has to do is get the physics right. It doesn't matter whether we understand her. It doesn't matter whether she's, um, she, 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 she's a public intellectual or, or not. All that matters, that's her task. I think some philosophers do things that perhaps are very hard to mediate to a general public. But if the whole business of philosophy isn't connected with the general life of the civilization, I think it's lost its point. A large part of what we're trying to do is to provide a, a, a framework within which we can think about all the other things we do, uh, not from, as it were, on top of them. I'm not saying philosophy is, as they used to say, the queen of the sciences. I used to say that about theology, actually. But, uh, but I'm, I'm saying rather that um, philosophy has this, this special place because we try to think, I th one philosopher once said uh, uh, um, something like, well, how, th how, how things in general fit together in general or something like that. I mean, I think that that is a distinctive role. So, um, you know, I'm happy to work at the theoretical end of many disciplines. I've done work, say, in literary theory, which I think is sort of useful for the study of literature. Uh, but, um, and so it's sort of on offer to literary theorists, uh, liter students of literature if they're interested. Um, but I don't think they need to do that in order to be good at what they do. It's just that sometimes we can come along and notice and notice one of those famous distinctions, and it can help to clarify an issue uh, in another field. You know, people borrow from philosophers all the time. Uh, often they borrow in ways that philosophers find a bit puzzling because they, they seem to involve borrowing things without really understanding them in the way that a philosopher would count as understanding them. Um, but that's okay, I don't mind that either. Uh, but I think that I don't want to claim that, as it were, everybody's profession would be better done if they spent uh, 10 minutes a day doing the philosophy of the profession. I don't think that's 
that's true. I think, I think it's rather that what we think about is the relationship between what everybody's doing and what everybody else is doing and how each of us can sort of fit it in together in a picture of the world and uh, in constructing our projects and deciding how we're going to spend our lives. Thank you.